Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Hey, man. Hey, man. Do you enjoy worshiping the Lord tonight? Man, I, I've, been, I've had a good time. This was awesome. This is awesome. Every time they get, they seem to get better to me. Just, you know, this is Wednesday night. They don't have to put out. That's not true. We worship God every time we get a chance, don't we? Amen. Well, my phone is completely locked up. Hang on, there it is. Psalm 68. I had to sign in, give a secret code, and swear, you know, whatever, my allegiance. To, I couldn't get it open. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those also who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, as wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But that's just part of the story. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yet let them rejoice exceedingly. Sing to God. Sing his praises to his name. Praise the Lord. Woo. I saw that. I read that a while ago. And I said, I don't know if I can wait to get up here to talk about this. This is... This was really, whoever wrote that, David, <laughs> was on fire for the Lord, wasn't he? <laughs> Praise the Lord. But, it, you know, it's, it's good to feel his presence, to be in, uh, and look at all these people here tonight. Praise the Lord. I just now actually looked out there to see pretty good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, we don't have a lot of prayer requests today, but I think that's good. That's good. God is taking care of us. Uh, Mike Murray, are you, is he out here? He's with the youth. Okay. Uh, we are praying for him as he goes for a second interview for a job in Dallas next Wednesday at 1230. It will be an in-person interview in Dallas. Uh, he would like for us to pray for traveling mercies and that God's will be done. And it's really hard to pray that prayer. <laughs> it's really hard. I've told him, said, I have great, uh, great, I kind of, kind of have to hold myself back on that prayer a little bit, but no, I want God to have his will in their lives for sure. And uh, we prayed for Shirley Med Medlock's daughter last week. They thought they rushed her to the hospital and thought she was going to need an emergency acumdectomy, yeah. you know, her appendix. <laughs> <laughs> but they did a CAT scan and they found diver diverticulitis and put her on two antibiotics and a pain pill. But anyway, God is going to take care of her. There's no problem that too big or too small that God can take care of. Is that right? Amen. Let's stand tonight. Father, we love you tonight. We praise you, Lord. I thank you, God, that we can come to your throne, Lord. At the spur of the moment, God, when we need you or whether we just want to praise you. Father, we love you and we thank you, God, for these needs we have tonight. God, I pray, Lord, for uh, traveling mercies and that for your will to be done for Michael Murray. Lord, as you take care of him, Lord, if this is where you want him to work, God, that's where I want him to be. He will be a light for you wherever he is at. And, Lord, I just pray, God, for blessings to be upon his family. And, Lord, I thank you for uh, Shirley Medlock's daughter. She didn't have to have that emergency surgery. Pray, God, that this diverticulitis will get healed. And we thank you, Lord, and we give you praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. You got your own. Okay. I wasn't even looking. <laughs> That's all right. Well, it's offering time. If you need an offering envelope, please raise your hand. The ushers will be glad to give you one. I just want to make a quick uh, announcement about Friday night is prayer night. Amen. Seven o'clock. We had an awesome time last time, right? <laughs> the Holy Ghost fell and we saw great, a great move of the Holy Ghost and we're looking forward to another one of those. Amen. So Friday night, it's going to be a great time. So if you can make it, come on out and we're going to bless the Lord. Amen. I said amen. amen. Amen, amen. Well, like I said, it's offering time, and as you prepare your offering, just want to share 
uh, some scripture with you. I got a couple of verses of scripture that I want to share from the book of Hag Haggai. And it says here in chapter 2, According to the word that I covenant with you when you came out of Egypt, God talking to Israel, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. It's good to know when God's with us, we don't have to fear, amen? But thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Somebody say he's able. <laughs> and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. And the glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. I just believe that we are that latter house. I just believe that. I believe that we are that latter house and we're about to see things that we've never seen. Uh, we're, we're that generation that's going to see things that nobody else has seen because God's glory is about, I really believe he's about to fall. Taking an offering, but I'm ready, I'm here to tell you, God is about to do some things in this church, in our generation, if we'll only believe, if we'll only trust. If we'll only proclaim and confess that we are that generation that the glory of God is going to fall upon. And he will be glorified. Hallelujah. So if you're ready, if you believe that, if we're ready to worship God and I give him, please give me the offering and confess. Thank you, Lord. This just work. Uh-oh. I'm on now. I normally have it wrote down. Come on now. All right, here we go. Lord, I worship you with my tithe and my offering. I thank you for bringing me out of bondage and the blessings. I believe I am now free from poverty and lack. Everything I put my hands to prospers. Satan, take your hands off my finances. Lord, let the ministry and spirits be released. Let them gather in my harvest now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. How many of y'all know you're going to prosper because God is a God of prosperity? That's our portion. I'm going to confess it and confess it and confess it, and I've received it. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. Well, I'm teaching tonight, and so I want to uh, get us ready to get into the Word, but I just want the Holy Spirit to have His way. And I want to share something with you before I get into the, to the teaching that God kind of dropped in my heart, I believe, even uh, this morning during my prayer time. I want to direct the, our attention. You don't have to go, go here, but it's in the book of, uh, the book of uh, Luke chapter 7. And this is what Jesus said about... John the Baptist. The Bible says, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than, than he. Now that verse of Scripture is speaking a lot of th different things. But Jesus is making a statement about John, and he says that, John is the greatest prophet of the Old Covenant, of the Old Testament. He was greater than Moses. He was greater than Elijah. He was greater than any of those prophets. And I, I, I asked God, why was that so? Why was John greater than any of those other prophets? And this is what I really believe he, he began to speak to me about. He says, John walked in more light than any prophet did before because he was filled with the Holy Ghost in his mother's womb. Y'all remember that? 
He was filled with the Holy Ghost in his mother's womb. And, and, and the light that was revealed to John that was so important was that he, John, must decrease, but that Jesus must increase. What a revelation. That when we understand that when Jesus increases or when we decrease, when we lose sight of ourselves, the Lord begins to be made manifest in our presence. As we die to self, as we die to those things that we want to do and come alive unto those things that glorify him. Amen? That's what it's all about. I believe then uh, Paul got another revelation along those lines, I believe in the, uh, Galatians chapter 2. I want to go there right quick. Galatians chapter 2. He said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Y'all remember that? Paul understood that death to self causes the glory of God to manifest. And I really believe that's what God is speaking to us today, that he wants us to realize that the more we die to our own personal wants, the more God can have his way in our lives. Amen? I really believe that. I really believe that. So I just want to kind of share that with you, that we must decrease so that he can increase. That's the perfect will of God. And like I said, John the Baptist really understood that, and Jesus said that because he had that type of revelation, he was considered the greatest prophet of the old covenant. Amen? Amen. Well, tonight, I want to teach on uh, something I've been teaching on down there in Roberts, up there in Robertson County for the past seven weeks. And uh, I'm not going to teach all of it, obviously. But it's, it's called The Kingdom, The Power, and The Glory. The Kingdom, The Power, and The Glory. Uh, like I said, for seven weeks we've been talking about that. And we first of all, we started talking about God's kingdom. And we spent several weeks talking about the kingdom of God and how the kingdom of God is relevant to us in our generation. And we spent, I think, about three weeks talking just about the kingdom of God. It's God's kingdom. Then we began to talk about God's power, the power of God. And then uh, just recently we began to talk about God's glory. And so tonight I want to focus on the aspect of God's, God's power. I want to talk about the power of God tonight. And our foundational text we've been using is in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse uh, 13. Let's begin to pray. Father God, I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide and lead us during this Bible study. I pray that you would begin to breathe upon your people, breathe upon this lesson. Holy Spirit, open our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears. Help us to understand what the Spirit is saying to the church tonight, where the power of God is concerned. In Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 6 and 13. This is Jesus talking. He says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Somebody say it's God's power. Somebody say it's God's power again. It's important that we always realize when we begin to talk about the power of God 
and the authority that God has given to the church that we always remember that we are not the source of the power. When we realize and understand that has a revelation, then God can freely manifest his power through us because then he can only trust us then. He can trust us with that power when we make sure that we understand that it's not us. We are the branches, hallelujah. He is the vine. And he is the one that does the miracles and the signs and the wonders. But that does not change the fact that he wants to manifest his great power through his church. Amen? So I want to... Uh, Make that a foundational topic at the beginning. God's power, it's his power, but that power has been delegated to the church through Jesus Christ. I always want to put that in there. It's through our faith in Jesus Christ. It's not by might, nor by power, but it's by his spirit. Uh, I believe when I begin to teach on the authority of God, the power of God, I spent almost the whole sermon focusing on that very uh, point, that it's God that does the works. It is the power of God that does the work, you know, so that we can always remember that it's him, so that our head won't get swole with pride, Amen. Because God wants to do some things. He really and truly wants to do, the, do some things, but he wants to do things like that through people he can trust. He said, I'm not going to share my glory with anybody, but I will work through my church if my church humbles themselves and understands that I am king. Amen? All right. Well, let's go now to the book of Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to see where that authority that was given to mankind, how it started. And I don't know how far we're going to get tonight. We'll get as far as the Holy Ghost allows us, but I really believe that God wants to open our eyes. And a lot of these things we already know, but then again, there are some believers just getting born again that don't know some of these things in terms of the dominion power that the church has been given through Christ. Verse 26 of chapter 1, the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion. Let them, the man that I created, have dominion. Another word for dominion is authority. And it also means power. So dominion was given to man by God. Like I said, we got a lot of new believers and some old believers that don't even understand that revelation that we have been given authority in the earth. The Bible says over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So that authority is ours, because God says so. Somebody say, God, give us light tonight. And he's about to give us light concerning these truths and these revelations concerning our place in him and the authority that, that has been given to us. Now let's go to Psalms 115. Authority given to us by God. Power given to us by God. Somebody praise his name tonight. Thank you, Lord, for divine grace, divine mercy, and divine light to walk in that which you have provided. We worship you tonight. Thank you, Jesus. 
Psalms 115, verse 14. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. So the Bible lets us know right there that it's the will of God that you live in divine increase. And that increase is to be passed on to your children from generation to generation. It's perpetual. It was never the will of God that the blessing end with you. It's meant to be passed on to your children, to every generation. Verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. But the Bible says, but the earth had he given to the children of men. So we, we realize then, according to Scripture, that, and we know that the heaven, God says, that's my domain. That's where I operate. That's where my throne is. But he says, but the earth he had given to the children of men, gave it to Adam and Eve. And the Bible says, because of that, we can now operate in a God-given authority without hindrance or without fear here in our generation. So, the Bible says, but the earth he had given to the children of men. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is our portion. So, when I realize that, when I understand that, I'm not ashamed or embarrassed when I operate in this dominion because I know that God will back me up. When I operate in this authority, this God-given authority, God will always back me up as long as I give him the glory and the praise. I use the word of God as a foundation when I come against obstacles and things that's trying to bind me up. I use the word of God and say that that thing does not have any authority over me because of the power and authority that God has given me through covenant relationship. Amen. So I, I got to have that in my thinking. When I'm living as a Christian on the earth, I got to have that as my understanding because there are things that are going to come against us to try to stop us from fulfilling the will of God in our generation. But when I have a revelation that through Christ, I can overcome anything that comes against me by the power and the authority of God. I can have victory 100% of the time, according to the Word of God. Now, let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. Faith for these things comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The more I meditate on truth like this, the more when circumstances come against me or when the curse tries to force its way into my life, I can resist it and overcome it. Now, let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it, and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So that was the only caveat to man walking in dominion authority. He had to live in obedience to that word. Failure to do so would cause the curse or spiritual death to come into man's existence. 
But again, it was never the will of God that mankind ever taste death. Amen. Now, let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, had God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. I'm going to stop right there. Because the whole thing right here is out of order. All of it. The moment that the serpent speaks to her, it's out of order. He spoke to her, and he shouldn't have, because he did not have permission to speak. She was in authority, and for him to speak to her was totally out of, the, uh, out of God's order, because he was, she was in authority. And the serpent operated outside of that. The moment that, she, that he spoke to her, she had the authority right then to say, you know what, you're out of order, and from this day forward, you're going to crawl on your belly. She had that kind of authority given to her by God. See, when God gave mankind authority, he meant it. He meant that all the authority, that delegated authority, is yours to do with as you choose. So for, for the snake to speak to her in that way, he was out of order, and she should have operated in her authority by saying, you know what? You don't have permission to speak to me. You know, even in the army, that's how it works. When you come to a superior, you ask what? Permission to speak. And this is how it should have been right there. That uh, snake, the moment he, he spoke to her, that should have signaled to Eve, this is a situation where I need to use my God-given authority. Let's look at verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. So again, she should have operated right then in her God-given authority and cast him out or made him crawl on his belly just like God did when he came to the earth and took over. Because she didn't recognize the authority and the power that she had, she lost everything. And it was not the will of God that she lose it. But she lost everything because she did not operate in that power and authority given to her by God. Now let's look at uh, verse 17. The Bible says, And Adam, he said, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of your wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring to thee. And thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. And in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken... For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou shalt return. Now, when that happened, that authority that Adam and Eve had was now given to Satan. Y'all always have to remember that. That authority that was transferred to Adam, uh, given to Adam and Eve, they gave it to Satan the moment they disobeyed God. And that authority was real. I want to show you um, in the book of Luke. Let's go there. All of this is just uh, vital information that we need to get really, really to the good part. We need to understand what happened 
in the garden and the mistakes that were made so that we can understand the authority that we have been given through Jesus Christ. Now it says here in Luke chapter 4, verse 5, <clears throat> and the Bible says, And the devil taking him, talking about Jesus, up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So Satan took Jesus in the spirit room, he began to show him all the kingdoms of the world. The Bible says in verse 6, And the devil said unto him, All this power or authority will I give you, and the glory of them, for that it is delivered unto me, and to whosoever I will give it. So we see there that Satan had the authority. Adam gave it to him, and he tells Jesus that all this authority was given to me, and I have the authority to give it to you or to whomever I choose to give it to. If you will fall down and worship me, all shall be yours. Of course, our Lord said, Jesus answered, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The last Adam took back the authority that the first Adam gave to him. Amen. Through his obedience. All of that authority that Adam and Eve lost in the garden was taken back by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All the power over the elements of the earth all the power over every creeping thing, all the power over disease, it was now given back to Jesus Christ because of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. His inheritance that he received through his obedience, that's, that, that inheritance has been given to the church. Scripture says, and you always need to remember this, Scripture says that we are heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. So that means that all of the authority that Jesus enjoys and walks in, that same authority he shares with the church. Amen. So Jesus took all of that authority back. It's in his hands, and he wants to work that authority through the church. God, give us light tonight. Give us divine light. May we see those things that have been accomplished by your death, by your burial, and by your resurrection. And those things, Lord, that have, are ours through covenant relationship. May your church begin to walk in them. May we begin to experience them by the power of your Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. Now, I want to go to the book of Colossians. And we're going to now get into the meat. Because this is where your faith is built up. We've, we found out how everything transpired in the past in terms of man receiving dominion from, from God and man losing that dominion from God and Jesus Christ taking that dominion back. But now, in order for us to experience that dominion authority in our lives as a church body, we have to have revelation concerning those things that are, have been freely given to us. He who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also, the Bible says, freely give us all things? Well, you got to understand that your heavenly father, if he gave Jesus, He's not holding anything else back. The only thing he's holding back is his glory. He said, I'll share my glory with no one. But everything else, he says, the earth is mine, and I'm giving it to my children, and I want my children to walk in dominion authority in the earth. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Colossians 1, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. 
So the Bible says we are, are, we're called now to be partakers of this inheritance. Not just talk about the inheritance. Not just read, read about the inheritance. But God wants us to be partakers of the inheritance. He wants you and I to command the elements. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, when you talk like that sometimes to the church, people kind of look at you kind of funny. But I've seen uh, people take authority over the elements. Pastor Mike, we, 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 when we uh, walked the streets of Calvert, we had an outreach. You remember this? And we were, um, looked like it wanted to rain. And we said, man, it, we, it, it can't rain. This is the will of God. We're here to minister. And, you know, we, bind, we bound that rain. We bound that storm. And it rained everywhere except where we were. <laughs> you remember that, Mike? Yeah, yeah. We, it rained all over Calvin except over the park where we were because we had decided to take authority over the elements because we believed it. We believed that in the name of Jesus, we did have the authority. We were there to minister for God, and we had the authority to do that in his name. So we are partakers of this inheritance. Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also. And greater work shall you do because I, I, I go unto the Father. I'm enthroned at the right hand of God, and I represent you there. Hallelujah. So this is why we can operate in this authority, because of what he has done for us and what he wants to do through us through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, uh, verse 13, who had delivered us, from the authority of darkness, the power of darkness. So Satan at one time had authority over us, but once we gave our life to Jesus Christ and we became new creatures in Christ Jesus, that authority that he had over us was broken forever. And the Bible says he had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And it's in that kingdom that the power and authority of God is ours but we have to believe it. We have to look at things through the eyes of God and trust that his word for us is true. Just like it was in the early church, they walked in that authority, they saw signs, wonders, and miracles. We're going to see the same thing in our generation. The glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. I believe that. When, we, when our minds become renewed to what we're talking about tonight, that the authority and power of God is ours, that greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. When we really believe that, that is when God's power is going to explode, hallelujah, in this church, and it's going to explode in this entire community. I believe that. I believe that. In whom, verse 14, in whom... We have redemption. We're not going to be redeemed. We have redemp redemption right now. Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So when you study your New Testament, and I learned this a, a long time ago, uh, listening to uh, Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagin, they would always say, underline <laughs> every place in the Bible where you say, in whom and in Christ. Because that's talking about your relationship to God through him. And that all those things that belong to Jesus belong to you. So the Bible says here in verse 14, In whom, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So God views me as if I've never sinned. He sees me that way. He sees me holy. He sees me raised up seated together with him in heavenly place. That's how God sees me. In order for me to walk in that power and authority, I got to see myself that way. On a moment-by-moment -moment basis, I got to believe that what God says concerning the new birth is true and that the authority in Christ is real and relevant in my life right here in 2022. Amen? Let's look at verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things 
in earth or things in heaven. So the Bible tells us, it lets us know that this victory has been won through the blood of his cross and God has reconciled me to him fully and completely and forever. Hallelujah. That's my portion. That's your portion. When you walk in that knowledge and when the, in that revelation, then God can freely flow through you and the powers of darkness will never have any authority over you ever because of what God has done through Jesus. It's a wonderful thing that he has done. May our minds catch up with our spirits in terms of the understanding of who we are in Christ and those things that have been freely given to us. Col Colossians chapter 2. Let's go there. Thank you, Lord. Verse 13. And you being dead in your sins... And in the uncircumcision of your flesh, that's talking about our former life, that's talking about how we were before we got born again, before we were reborn by the Spirit of God. The Bible says, hath he quickened or hath he made alive together with him? So this is what God did and what God saw when he raised Jesus from the dead. He saw Pastor Larry being raised from the dead at that same moment. God had that perspective. He could see Pastor Larry, when Jesus was raised from the dead, he saw Pastor Larry being raised from the dead also. And so, that un when we understand it that way, we begin to understand that we too can live the resurrected life just as he, he does. As he is, so are we in this present world. See, his life is our life. Everything that he has, I have. He's not ashamed to call me brother, hallelujah. He did it for me. And, I, 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 and what, what that causes me to do, it causes me to want to worship him the more and the more and the more. You see what I'm saying? That's what this is about. It's about understanding what God has done and the great love he has for us through his son. The Bible says, He had quickened us together with him, having forgiven us all trespasses. Glory to God. Verse 14, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Everything that was written against us, all those sins that we committed, which were written against us, that were on record, the Bible says God bl has blotted them out by the blood of his Son, which was contrary to us. He, talked, he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. See, Satan don't want you to know that. He don't want you to know. He don't want you to know that God loves you just as much as he loves Jesus Christ. <laughs> See, some, some people, they, get, they, they don't understand that. Jesus said that himself. He said, Father, I will that you would love them just like you love me. See, that's, that's how powerful the new birth is. That's how much authority he has given to us through Jesus Christ. He has made us sons and daughters of the living God. You don't ever have to be ashamed to go to the throne. That's your place. You can go there anytime you want and ask God for anything that's in that covenant because he wants to give it to you. But it comes through meditating on truth like this. The Bible said he nailed it to his cross. Verse, verse 15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So everything that Satan had that he stole from Adam, Jesus took it back. He, the Bible says he spoiled principalities. Everything that Satan had, Jesus took it back and was glorified in doing so. 
and all of the victory that he experienced, he wills for his church to experience it in our generation. He wants you to know the power of his resurrection. He truly does. Paul understood that. Paul had a hunger for that. He said, I want to know him, and I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know all those things that are mine because he was raised from the dead. I want to experience them in my generation. Paul was not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was willing to endeavor to preach it wherever he went. And he was willing to suffer even for that because he knew the value of this. And he wanted to share it with everybody. And that's what I want to, I want to share the gospel of Christ to whomever will listen to it. Because the gospel of Christ is the power of God. Truly is the power of God. God never ever meant for us to, once we got born again, he never meant for us to have one day of weakness, one day of timidity. He wants us to, to live like Jesus lived when Jesus walked the earth. With an understanding that God the Father is our Father, just like He's Jesus' Father. <sighs> Let's go to Matthew chapter 8. Let's go there. Now, we're, we're about to see an example of Jesus walking in that type of authority. Verse 23. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. Verse 24 says, And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea. A great storm, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Talking about Jesus, he was asleep. All this was going on around him, and he was at divine peace. Verse 25, and his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're about to perish. And he said unto them, why are you fearful? O ye of little faith. <laughs> he said, why are you afraid? He's perplexed with them. Then the Bible says he did something that we need to see. Then he arose, he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So what he did was he took authority over the earth. That's simply what he did. He took authority as the Son of Man. He took authority over the wind and the waves. The Bible says there was a great calm. Verse 27. And the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him. What kind of person is this? What kind of man that could command the wind and the waves? They're, they're amazed. They marvel at it. Well, I'll tell you what kind of man he was. He was a Genesis 1 and 26 man is what he was. That's what he was. See, he, he actually believed that God gave him authority. And he acted on it. See, what holds us back a lot of times is that we really, we, we've heard the gospel, we hear these things, but we don't really believe that God will really back us up if we step out like that. But see, Jesus was 100% sure that every time he commanded things to move, mountains to move, that the mountains would move. He knew it because he knew that God had given him that authority. Randy, he wants you to know that you have that authority. He wants every person in the body of Christ to understand that. You know, what he said about John the Baptist was true. 
He said, there has not risen a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But then he said something else. He said, but he who was least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. In other words, because of the new birth, because you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, and old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new to you, you can walk in more power and authority than John the Baptist ever thought about walking in. Hallelujah. That's what the new birth does. So Jesus spoke to the winds and the waves, and the Bible says they obeyed him because he understood who he was and what had been given to him has a covenant right. Let's go to Mark chapter 11. i got a couple of more minutes. Now, you know, we study along these lines, but what causes us to really begin to experience these things on this level is um, meditating on this truth. Meditating on this kind of truth. Mark 11. I think I wrote. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Verse 27 of Mark 11. And they come again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, talking about Jesus, there come to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now, you know, they was always confronting Jesus, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. They did not like him because he was uh, taken away from their pocketbook. The Bible says, and they said unto him, but what, uh, by what authority do you do these things? And who gave you the authority to do these things? So they were, they were not questioning the miracles. They were questioning who gave him the authority to do the miracles. And the one who gave him the authority to do the miracles, had they understood Scripture, was God back in Genesis. See, a lot of times, the most religious people, they miss it. They miss it because they're walking in the natural, in the, in the carnality of their mind. The simplicity of the gospel, it messes with them. Because they don't understand that God meant what he said and said what he meant. When that thought, when he said, I want my man to live in the earth in power and authority. That's why they say, who gave you this authority? Had they known and understood scripture, they would have known that any man who was, had faith in the word could walk in that type of authority. Jesus simply believed it and operated in it. Amen. And see, here's the thing about the church today. That authority is ours. But if we don't act on it, it does us no good. And I, like I said, we're all learning. We're all growing in this area. But I believe in these last days, God's getting ready to do some things because the world is getting darker and darker and darker. And the only thing that they're going to really understand is a church that walks in the love of God and that walks in the power of God. That when we speak and we say things according to the Word of God, and when those things happen, then they're going to take notice. But it comes to a church that understands who they are in Christ. And I think that's what our prayer, and I'm, I'm closing, I think that's where our prayer needs to be. That God would really open our eyes to these things. That he would give us light concerning these things. Like I say, I taught about seven weeks on, in, on this subject matter, so in one night we couldn't touch on all of it. But I want you to leave here tonight with a hunger with a hunger that everything that we talked about tonight, straight out of the Bible, that you and I can do in him or through, through Christ. And that God does not hold back his power, but that he wants to work his power through you. 
And the only one who can reveal that to you is the Holy Spirit, though. All the teaching that we do, it's the Holy Spirit that has to open our eyes. Now, I want to pray that prayer in the book of Ephesians over you. I pray it all the time for myself, and I, I just want to pray it over you tonight. And I believe that that prayer is, is, has anointed today as it was when Paul prayed it. So I want you to open up your heart tonight to God. Just really open up your heart to him. Because once I pray this prayer, he's going to do it. Father, we ask that you would give to us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. That you'd open the eyes of our understanding that we would know what is the hope of your calling and what the riches of the glory of your inheritance is in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of your power to us who believe. According to the working of your mighty power which you wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead and set him at your own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this world, but in also in that which is to come. You placed all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. So I pray tonight, Lord God, that your people will begin to walk in that which you have ordained before the foundation of the world. The power and authority that you have given to Jesus Christ, that, your, that his church that will begin to walk, his body will begin to walk in the power that the head knows and enjoys. And that we will begin to experience signs, wonders, and miracles like never before. That our lives, oh God, will be a living testimony to who you are and the greatness of our God. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, God. And we worship you tonight. We will, oh God, to be those who live at your feet because of this revelation. We will, God, to be those who worship you in the holy place, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, God, where, where we never leave your presence. May the Holy Spirit work through this church, this ark fellowship, the members doing the works of Christ for your kingdom glory, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you.